Welcome to Megafon Sport. It's my absolute pleasure to welcome John Robbie, rugby and radio legend, to our channel today. We're going to have a bit of a chat about John's history, but also about what he thinks of the Springboks and the Irish teams at the moment, and a bit of a rivalry that's developing between these two countries. Welcome, John. Lovely to be here, and Ian, thank you very much for asking me. It's a pleasure. I was so happy. A uh, big friend of our channel, Sean Larkin in Australia. Uh, I often speak to him. He's, he's one of my uh, ardent followers and one of my ardent critics. You know, Envia, your camera is not up to standard and your sound doesn't sound so good. And, you know, I've taken everything to art to listen to him and then eventually introduced me to you. And I'm so happy that you're here. And uh, I want to talk to you about, firstly, your history in the rugby. Where did you start playing rugby and where did your love for rugby um, come from? Wow, well, that goes way, way back. Um, although I'm sort of Irish, I played for Ireland and was born and lived in Ireland until I emigrated here. My mum was Welsh and my dad was Scottish. My mum died last year, age 99. Can you believe it? Yeah. Still living at home. And um, her parents came over and lived with us in Greystones, just south of Dublin. And my granddad, who love is not a strong enough word, I, I worshipped him. He really was the loveliest man, a retired school teacher. And being from the valleys, he had a love of rugby. And so because I love my granddad, I used to go with him to watch rugby. And because Bective Rangers, a club in Dublin, the great Cliff Morgan, who played, of course, in the 1955 Lions, he married an Irish girl and played a season with Bective Rangers. So as a result, I know this sounds very complicated, but I'm coming to the point. Mm. As a result, Bective Rangers, because of their Cliff Morgan link, had annual fixtures against Cardiff, against Neath, against Ebuvale, these great Welsh clubs. And the highlight of my life was going with my granddad to watch Bective Rangers playing these Welsh clubs. And gradually rugby through my granddad just became part of my DNA. And I'm talking about at the age of six, at the age of seven now, I was absolutely hooked. And I think until I retired from rugby at the age of 32 over here, it was my primary, primary passion in life. And in many ways still is. You played for Ireland a couple of times and you started uh, somewhere in Leinster, if I'm not mistaken. In Leinster now, we all know who Leinster is, actually. It's a different story to in the old days. All we knew was the Hurricanes and the Auckland Blues and likes. Nowadays, we know what's going on in, 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 in Irish rugby. We know, we know you, how do you, you, told, you told me how to pronounce it, Connacht and the Munster <laughs> and Leinster and everybody else. Tell me about your Leinster background. That's quite interesting to me. Yeah, well, I mean, the, there are four provinces in Ireland. And traditionally, the three strongest rugby have been Ulster in the north, um, Leinster in the east around Dublin, and then Munster in the south around Cork and Limerick. And Connacht was always the sort of Cinderella province around, around uh, Galway, which has changed very much. I mean, they've been one of the magnificent success stories uh, in recent years. So you played, schools rugby was huge, and I was lucky enough to go to a, 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 a small school that had a rugby tradition, but it wasn't one of the giants. And my year, 50 years ago last year, we won the Leinster Schools Cup for the one and only time in our history. And I was on that team. And it's mm -hmm. even today, people talk about it as one of the great success stories. And it's, it's I would say playing for the British and Irish Lions is my second biggest achievement in rugby. Winning that Schools Cup was my biggest achievement. And, and a lot of people laugh at that, but, but that's the fact. And then I went to Trinity College Dublin, Dublin University, which is the oldest um, uh, uh, continuous surviving rugby club in the world. It was founded in 1854. And I had a wonderful university career. And uh, again, I was elected captain. I was vice captain of my school team. I was elected captain of the university. I was the youngest ever captain of the oldest surviving club in the world, continuous club. At 19, I was captain in this club. And through good luck and a lot of hard work and planning uh, we ended up having the most successful season for 60 years so between the school and the university i suppose i was a promising youngster and i was a um i suppose i was quite cocky being a scrum half and uh, i was quite vocal on and off the field and then out of the blue i got picked to play for leinster in the final interpro of the season against ulster had a reasonably good game but didn't get selected for the Irish trial. They used to have a full Irish mm. trial where they've had two teams and two benches. So I wasn't selected for the trial or the bench. So I wasn't in the top five scrum halves in Ireland. And I didn't really mind because I was only just uh, still 19 years of age or just turning 20. And what they did was the selectors, the big five, as they called them, before, before tea, dinner, 
they used to announce the squad that was going to train on the Sunday before the international. Then after dinner, they went back in and announced the team that was going to play against Australia. And I don't know what they had to drink at that meal, because when they announced the squad for the squad training, I wasn't one of the four scrum halves. And when they announced the team after dinner, I was in the team to play against Australia. So out of the blue, this, and I looked about 15, believe it or not, and I was scared stiff playing club games, let alone provincial games. And then I found myself picked against Australia. So I have no idea how it happened. I think it was probably because they decided to give a couple of youngsters a chance. My fly half that day was a certain Ollie Campbell, who went on to become one of the greatest fly halves mm. that ever played the game and still a very dear friend of mine. And, uh, and yeah, so when I look back at it now, I mean, it all happened in a real world, MV. I mean, it was ridiculous. This, you know, I was a kid now suddenly playing international rugby. Uh, but I look back on it now, it's even more incredible. And as I'm talking to you, the hairs mm. on my arm yeah, are rising. Same here. <laughs> I can imagine. The, ima <laughs> so you played how many times? Nine times for Ireland? Any highlights that stand out for you? Very, very few. I played nine games for Ireland and lost nine. <laughs> so I always say that, that I'm the most consistent rugby player that ever played. And it was quite funny, uh, a funny story, which I tell in, in dinners when I speak at dinners and so on and do MC work, that, that um, having played nine games for Ireland and lost nine, we emigrated to South Africa, you know, a very controversial move in, in 1981. And the first year that I left, Ireland won the Triple Crown for the first time in 40 years. So you can imagine how we felt. And the next year we went back for our first holiday and it just happened to coincide with Ireland versus Wales at Lansdowne Road, the old stadium, which I loved so much. And uh, I was looking forward to seeing this new, winning, successful Irish side after my rather disastrous career. And of course, Ireland got thumped by 25 points. And after the game, I remember in the old West Stand, you know, and it was took a long time to clear because it's not like the modern stadiums. And as the crowd was clearing, you know, you chatted to your neighbours about the game and so on. And it was part of the sort of the, 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 the ritual of being at rugby. And while we were doing that, a voice, broad Dublin accent from the back of the West Stand said, hey, Robbie. And people sort of stopped. Is that John Robbie there? So sort I of stopped and I, yeah, is that John Robbie back from South Africa? And I now was sort of doing the royal wave, you see, and then the, he stuck the knife and he said, hey, Robbie, he says, you're some feckin' good luck charm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so sud suddenly I thought it's nice to be remembered. No, my, my, my Irish tour, we went on that first ever Ireland tour to New Zealand in 1976, which was a huge success. We were hugely popular. We did much better. We lost the test match 10-3, which was a warm-up test for the 76 uh, Springboks, uh, uh, All Blacks, to go to New Zealand, to go to South Africa in 76. Mm. And that tour was absolutely wonderful. We were well-managed, well-coached, brilliantly captained, and had a great team spirit. So that was the highlight of my Ireland career, which otherwise was, although a huge honour, was pretty disastrous. I remember that 76 All Black tour specifically for one person. That was Sid Going, number the, oh. the scrum off. You know, I remember him so well. I don't know why. It's, he's just stuck in my head from all those years ago. It's about almost 50 years ago. Amazing player. Did you ever play against him? I played two half games against him on that tour in 1976. Um, we played against South Canterbury, who were head of top of the second division as our first game. And incidentally, a, a journalist from Ireland, because we just won the wooden spoon, come last in the championship. And they said the only way Ireland will win a game in New Zealand is if they cancel the tickets to New Zealand and go to Galway instead. That was the sort of feeling. And our first game was against <clears throat> South Canterbury in a place, a lovely place called Timaru. And we were standing in the, 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 the uh, tunnel. And I remember Tom Grace, the Irish captain, who I looked upon as a sort of father figure. He'd been with the Lions in 74. And he said, how are you feeling, Junior? That was my nickname, Junior. And I looked at him and we're going out to play in New Zealand against this top of the second division who everyone said are a really tough side. And I said, I'm scared shitless, excuse my mm -hmm. language, expecting he'd sort of put his arm around me and saying, John, don't worry. And he said, uh, so, so am I. <laughs> <laughs> 
But a, 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 anyway, we went out and played that game. And then the next game was against a very tough side, um, North Auckland. Northlands, they call them now. North Auckland up in uh, Fongaray. And Sid Going was the scrum half. And I was on the bench. Second game, Donald Caniff was the other Irish scrum half. And he went in and played. And then before half time, he uh, got concussed. So I came on as a sub and played half a game against Sid Going. And it was an amazing. And, and uh, again, another, another story that comes back. So many stories coming back, MVM. Mm. I remember they did, of all things, a short line out with two men. And they threw the ball over the top to Sid Going, the scrum half, who took it and basically ran straight at our, the rest of our forwards and could still cause mayhem because he was so fast and strong and such a low center of gravity. So the throw went over and Sid Going was, it was a little bit too high and he was to take the ball like that. And I was coming up to him and I thought, I am going to smash Sid Going. You know, he was wide mm-hmm. open, high on the ball like that. Little John Robbie, 20 years of age, I am going to smash Sid Going. And as I came to him, this piston came out caught me under the chin, lifted me up backwards, and he went on and beat the first line of defense and made 30 yards. And in that moment, MV, I'm not joking, I realized I could be a very, very good rugby player, but I was never going to be a great one because I realized what true greatness was. And then in the test match, they picked a guy called, I think his name was Davis, my memory's going because he was uncapped and Sid going the test match against Ireland. Mm. They wanted to give him a cap before he went to South Africa. So he played and got injured. And so Sid going came on in the second half. So I have the great honor of having played two halves against Sid going. Mm. And he was one of the most brilliant players I ever saw and a quiet, quiet, devout man. You know, he was a, a, a religious Mormon guy. And I remember sitting by him at the dinner and I was so sorry a couple of months ago when I heard that he had passed mm. away. But I'm so honored that I played two halves, two halves against him. So uh, I also remember on that 76 tour, it was one of the dirtiest tours mm. for a long, long time. And I remember Sid going could throw a good right hand, but he certainly played it very clean against me. All right. And then British Eyes Lion, Irish Lions. In South Africa, you know, that's one of the big things. Um, oh. We still talk about 97, we lost against, of course, Henry Hannibal missed that one kick. And, you know, it's the things that stick in your mind. You know, never mind the All Blacks. That's all important to the likes. But British Eyes Lions, you only play them every 12 years or so. Those are the ones that, that really matter. And I mean, at the, for the past couple of years, we've luckily been on top of them. But when you were toured here in 1980, what was it like then? And tell me about that tour. Well, like, like everything else with my rugby story, it's never straightforward. And I, I'll take you back three years before to 1977. And I was in the Irish team now, and uh, I'd had a good game against Scotland. And the last we'd lost, as usual, because I lost every game, but I'd had a good game. And apparently I'd outplayed Dougie Morgan, who was in line to be the second scrum half for the British and Irish Lions to go to New Zealand. Brynmore Williams was going to go, the Welsh scrum mm. half, brilliant, brilliant guy. Gareth Edwards had retired. And um, so we played France on the last day of the season and Scotland played Wales. And that night they were picking the British and Irish Lions team to go. So I was in with a chance and I'd never trained so hard in my life. There was a month, there was, um, was it a month or two, two weeks between the games and I'd trained every single day on my own with teams. I was never fitter or more prepared for my one chance, I thought, to go with the Lions. And uh, I remember the game kicked off in Dublin, and I made a sort of a half break, and I tried to drop at goal, which was unsuccessful, and I made an, and I just was bubbling. And uh, it, after two minutes, I tried to make a break, and I slipped on the, the ground. It was a bit of rain about on top of a hard ground. And two characters, Jean-Pierre Reeve and uh, uh, Jean Skrela, Two famous, famous French mm. flankers dived on top of me and I broke my leg. My leg was gone. I broke mm. my leg. And I thought, I remember being in tears, not so much for the pain, which was considerable, because I thought that's my lion's dream mm. gone. Because even if I hadn't been selected, I might have been a replacement and so on. Then I went to university in the UK and a little guy called Colin Patterson came on the scene who was absolutely brilliant. And I was out of the picture for three years. So I really thought that my 
chance of, of the ultimate dream, the British and Irish Lions, was gone. And uh, then in 1980, they selected the British and Irish Lions team and uh, Bill Beaumont was the captain. But during this championship, there'd been a very dirty game between Wales and England at Twickenham. And uh, uh, England had won. They won the Grand Slam that year. But it was a dirty game and a, a Welsh flank called Paul Ringer got sent off, which was almost unheard of in those days. So there was really bad blood between the Welsh who were the dominant team, and England, who were starting to challenge them. Now, as you probably know, being a rugby fan, there's an annual, or was, I don't know about now, the Barbarians used to go to Wales and play four games over the Easter holiday. They used to play Panath, they used to play Swansea, Cardiff, and Newport. And it was, a, one, it is, or was, one of the great honours to go on that tour. And because they'd selected the British and Irish Lions team, they picked the Barbarians. There were no British and Irish Lions players who'd been selected because obviously they didn't want to risk injury. So I got picked to play on that, on that tour. And Billy Beaumont, they made an exception and he captained the team against Cardiff. And this was to show the Welsh, the Lions captain, honoured Wales, and it was to try and mend bridges mm. after this dreadful, dreadful game in, in Twickenham. And in those days, again, believe it or not, the only games that were shown live on television rugby games were the internationals in the five nations as it was then the oxford and cambridge varsity match and the cardiff game on easter sunday the barbarians against cardiff and luckily enough i had a cracker of a game it was one of those games where everything happened to come right and after the game sid miller the great sid miller uh, who was the manager of the lions came to me and said you're a replacement for the lions so now i was back in official replacement even though there were no official replacements, he told me I was replacement. And then um, I was captain of Leinster at the time. We went to Romania, which was like going to the moon in those days. It was a, you know, behind the mm. Iron Curtain. Very tough tour. They were fully professional soldiers and, and um, policemen. And we got beaten there. But we had a great time, but a very, very tough tour. I came home then to dig the garden and, you know, spent time with my wife and 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 our little son then. And um, I got a phone call to say, would you like to play a game in Zimbabwe? One game, Goshawks against the Quakers are playing in Bulawayo. And Jenny, my wife said, all right, you'll never get a chance to go to Africa, which is ironic when you look at how things have, <laughs> have turned out in my life, in our lives. And I went and played in that game at Hartsfelt in Bulawayo. The British Lions were in South Africa, British and Irish Lions. Just before we went out on the field, there was a knock on the door, tap, tap, tap. And someone stuck their head in and said, where's John Robbie? We've just got a call. Terry Holmes has been injured. Lions scrum half. You've got to play this game, fly down to Cape Town tomorrow and become a British and Irish Lion. And if people think that I was not one of the most physically engaging players in my rugby career, you should have seen me that day, MV, because I never went mm -hmm. near anything because I was joining the Lions and came, uh, joined the Lions and ended up having a wonderful tour, never lost a game and ended up playing in the final test. So I finally got my test match win, which was at Loftus, British Ooh. and Irish Lions against the Springboks. So as I say, everything that seems to ha have happened to me in my rugby career is never straightforward. Yeah, well, at Loftus, no hope. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned, Sean, when Sean said you guys came to watch the uh, Irish play against South Africa this year at Loftus, I'm gonna. I'm jumping around a little bit. I wanted to know no, what you thought do, of that please test. Do. Yeah. What did you think of that um, test? Well, the the, uh, the, 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 the the Lions test, or about Sean at, at, no, at sure, you and Sean. I want to just ask you about you and Sean quickly. Yeah. <laughs> well, me and Sean was fantastic. Cause Sean Larkin and Sean, hi, great to see you, my mate. And uh, what a wonderful time we had together. We go way, way back. Uh, Sean was a, a, a um, an MBA student at Trinity College Dublin, and we'd become great great friends. Um, so Sean got in touch with me and said, "We're coming over to the game," and uh, he said, "Look, I want to go early, and I don't want to go anywhere else. I don't want to go to one of the pubs or clubs around. I want to go and experience the atmosphere at Loftus." So I picked Sean. We went up there. Um, we we went to the uh, I think it's the Pretoria Urs uh, primary mm. school. We parked there. We walked in. This beer tent was unbelievable, and the atmosphere was fantastic. You know, there was always, and funnily enough, it's the same observation about the All Blacks afterwards. There was always a tension 
about a about a, a, a Springbok game, particularly against the All Blacks. But I hadn't been to a live test for quite a while, and and. I couldn't believe how how optimistic everybody was. Also, the profile of the crowd. You know, there were so many black, colored, whatever, Indian supporters as well, all wearing Springbok kit, which was something, let's be honest, that wasn't universally loved in South Africa for a long, long time, for obvious reasons. And I think Sean in particular, and I'd been telling him about this on the car on the way up, that, you know, expect things might be a little bit tense at times. It was magnificent. And Sean and I sat there and had a few beers and just enjoyed it. And and uh, and I couldn't believe the number of people who recognized me, either from, you know, mm-hmm. my rugby days when I looked a, a lot younger or from the radio days. And uh, so I was quite the celebrity sort of meeting people and everything like this. And it remains one of the most wonderful days we had. And uh, yeah, and the only trouble was there were some Irish mates of mine who were over and for whatever reason we missed linking up and and so on and of course the Springboks won and I'm a Springbok supporter now and you can't believe how pissed off a lot of my Irish mates get when I say mm. Eka Saboka. I was about to ask you though that 1980 uh, Loftus compared to 2024 Loftus the differences as the rugby from a rugby point of view not not so much the you know, the, the change environment and the likes, but just the way that things have changed from then till now in, in terms of supporting and and, 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 and that. Uh, Loftus remains my favourite rugby ground in the whole world. It's, I, n- I never had a bad game at Loftus. I had my Lions test at Loftus. I played for Transvaal when we beat the Northerns for the first time year uh, there at Loftus. I had a Springbok trial at Loftus when we nearly caused, I captained the, the second team in a Springbok trial. So Loftus remains a huge, mm. huge favourite. And and uh, I must be honest, as we went into that ground, my memory went back to 1980 when I was this, you know, I was then, I think, 25 years of age, fulfilling my ultimate dream, mm. not alone getting on the, the Lions side, but playing in a test match against the Springboks. And, uh, and and then, of course, things were different because it was the old South Africa. It was a 99% white crowd, Afrikaans. And there was the sort of, um, I suppose, this, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Almost this insular feeling of South Africa in those mm. days. The world is against us. We still have rugby. All the things that, that, that have changed so much in the country today. And, and I remember he- hearing the national anthem being played and, and the, the singing of, of De Stem in those days. And it sent absolute goosebumps down, down my arms. But of course, it was a great win. So on the rugby achievement point of view, I mentioned my school's career was an absolute highlight. But that was, I suppose, the, 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 the pinnacle. And of course, the game has changed now. It's professional. It's very, very uh, different. But I suppose being an old fogey, I still love the old days when the forwards went and got the ball and the backs mm. used it. And and it was much more simple, if I can put it that way. But having said that, rugby today is still is fantastic. I, I, I look, as do many of my old teammates, I mean, even someone like Ray Mort, one of the strongest guys who actually tackled me that day and I couldn't sit down for three weeks afterwards, that particular test. I reminded him of it uh, recently. And, and um, we look at the modern players. You know, we look at the modern players and say, my God, how can they, how can their bodies put up with that? But I suppose when you look back at the old highlights, our game was pretty good and pretty hard as well. I think yours was harder. Of course, it was dirtier and uh, there wasn't all the signs involved in it, you know, and the recovery periods and, you know, all yeah. that. I think you guys were much tougher. I'm not saying that they're not tough. I mean, obviously they're tough, but I mean, yeah. from what you guys had to go through, I wanted to ask you one more thing about the rugby and sitting in Loftus this year now and you listen to this anthem being sung and the one thing I always look out for is whether everybody sings the entire anthem yeah and that's very important to me and that to me is one of the things that's changed a lot it's where rugby was a divisive thing before it's now become a unifying thing absolutely and 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 that and that was one of the things I mean there is still is this slight increase in volume for the second half of the of the but every year it's getting less and mm. less and less and 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 um going to the two old blacks game w- was wonderful wonderful i was determined to hate the new cape town stadium because i love i love mm. newlands i love the uh, intimacy of newlands and the history and the tradition and coming to this modern bowl i was determined to hate it but i came away absolutely loving it and saying yeah you know 
I'm, I'm glad I'm glad they moved on. But but wonderful stuff. And and uh, and, and for me, it was lovely. Sean Larkin, who we mentioned, coming to his first test match, Springbok test match for a long, long time. And he was so keen to notice the small things. And some of the things that you've picked up there, and the, like the uh, anthem, like the uh, um, different representation there, the love of the place. I mean, the place, everybody was just in love. In fact, funnily enough, it was the Irish fans who I was a bit ashamed of. They were very grumpy after the loss. In my day, you won, you lost, you celebrated a win, you celebrated a loss. It was all part mm. of the fun. And I think that just, in a funny way, indicates how Ireland rugby has changed so much because now they are they are winners when in my days it was very happy happy go lucky but um my 1980 day in loftus and my day recently both of them i'll never forget all right now let's talk about the springboks first i want to talk to you about the springboks and ireland where we are this year now in terms of our positions as either the best or the second best team in the world number one the springboks what do you think makes this springbok side so good and why do they stay on top so long what has changed from you know say let's say 20 25 years ago what do you see is different now in south african rugby rassi erasmus no question what he has done and sia colisi and uh, i mean you know there's a whole lexicon in rugby now which i don't understand you know uh, you offload in my day you used to pass the ball now you offload the ball you know and uh, you used to tackle now it's line speed and all this sort of stuff and every interview they talk about the processes oh we trust our processes now i don't know what the hell that that means <laughs> but whatever I. it what 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 whatever it whatever it is that rassi has done and and you know it's it i think he was probably the first coach and let me tell you he's probably the one senior figure in rugby that I've never met in my whole time in South Africa, doing media, doing, playing rugby mm. on radio. I've never actually met Rassi Erasmus. And I'm fascinated. My good friend, David O'Sullivan, just wrote his, his book, actually. And, and uh, you know, he, he had mm. a lot of comments about Rassi. So I'm dying to actually meet him, have a beer with him and chat with him. But what he has done for South African rugby is amazing. And he obviously started off with total honesty. Total honesty where the Springboks were, total honesty about what they're doing, what they're trying to achieve, total honesty in terms of, of selection, in terms, and total honesty in terms of recognizing that, that the, the transformation of rugby is not a, a payback thing. It's not an affirmative action thing. It's about recognizing this incredible pool of talent that is there in South Africa. And we're only scraping the very surface of it. If you look at the incredible athletes who are in country areas, in informal settlements here, whatever, guys who are, could be world-class athletes. I mean, you, you look at our team at the moment. I mean, guys like, like Cheslin, Colby, Kirtley, Aronsa, uh, 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 Fassi at fullback. In my day, they would never have got a chance. You know, they would never have got a chance. And you look at them now, world-class players by any any standard. So what Rassi has done is he, he started with total honesty. He built up. And I think he got the tr trust is the wrong word. He's got the respect of the players. Now, this is something that I, I, I told you before, I was, a, um, I was never a world-class player. I was a very good player, but I was never a world-class player. But I like to think that I was cut above the average captain in terms of leadership. You know, people will, if you go back to Ireland, they'll say, John Robbie, quite a good player, but a very good leader. And my track record backs me up on that. And, and you know, I've, I've, I've touched on some of it. And, you know, you hear people talking about playing for the badge and playing for the, the colours and playing for the flag and that. Now, I think that's a lot of nods, all right? And I see the people with tears coming down. That's all an act. That's an act. People are not doing that. Because the flag, the anthem, the badge are always there, even when they're playing rubbish. So how can they be playing for, you know, it's not. Somewhere along the line, you've got a coach or you've got a captain and you are playing for them. You are playing for them. You respect them so much. They've put their trust in you and you are playing so that at the end of the game, they say, well done, that nod. Or at the end of the game, if they give you criticism, you take it as constructive, not negative. And what Rassi Erasmus and, and Sia Khaleesi have done and whoever the, the leadership, I don't know the management and, and people mm. and so on there, they have created that bond. That is iron tight. And it was very interesting. I was listening to um, Justin Marshall uh, on, on, on some podcast or something there. 
And he was saying the Springboks, what they've got now is what the All Blacks used to have. Mm. Losing is simply not an option. And if they lose, it is of such seriousness that, my goodness, they're going to bounce back. And that's why I knew they, they were overconfident in Argentina. There's no question about it. I could see the minute I could see those first couple of tackles being missed, I said, we're in trouble here. Mm. Overconfidence. And it's not a deliberate thing. It's something that creeps into a team when you think you're, you're going to lose. They lost by a point, marvellous comeback, etc. But when they came out here to Mbombela, I knew we were going to thrash the, the Argentinians. We were going to hammer them. I thought it would be even more because this team now took it personally. And they were looking at Rassi and saying, we've let you down mm. last time. By God, we're not going to let you down, let you down this time. And whatever Rassi has done with this odd way, with his lights on the roof, with his video criticizing the referee or whatever, Rassi Erasmus has built this, 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 this thing in where the players are playing for him. And also what he's done is using his head. He's now got, instead of, what, 25 players who can play for the Springboks at the required level, he's now got 50 players who can play at the required level. I mean, what other country could lose the locks that we have lost? and mm. come up and still out-scrum and out-jump the top teams in the world. Look at the scrum halves we have. I mean, they used to joke about the Welsh fly half factory. Do you remember in the days of Barry John and Phil Bennett and Max Boyce had that wonderful song about the, 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 the fly half factory? Look at the scrum halves we've got at the moment who are playing. A couple of them get injured. I mean, I thought Jaden Hendrickson was man of the match. I thought I looked there and I saw this guy and I just suddenly felt here is somebody who is in total, utter control. We passed at the right time. He ran at the right time. He kicked at the right time. OK, his goal kicking at the end wasn't great. And I thought Jaden Hendrickson, uh, most people would sort of look at, look at Faf. They'd look at Williams. They'd look at, uh, at, at uh, Reiner. Where are these scrum halves coming from? I watched, some of, I watched the Lions playing um, in that win against Ulster. And the Lions are playing such wonderful rugby at the moment. And there are guys there who don't feature on the national uh, uh, discussion. You know, you look at Frankie Horn playing in the, on mm. the flank. You look at this young winger who's come in. And I'm saying, gee whiz, we've got a, we've got a pool of talent. And that's wonderful because it means nobody can be overconfident. There's that wonderful line between being confident and being overconfident. And it's something that can sneak into a team, sneak into, a, into an organization. And I, at the moment, it's certainly, certainly not there. And if you beat the Springbacks, they're going to come back the next week, you know, with like men possessed, which is just what the All Blacks were for the last 20 or so years. They've lost that now. OK, John, the one thing that we've been talking about a lot on this channel is the fact that South Africa, the Springboks, uh, used to be used to being the underdogs, you know. We always felt like, yeah, I know we like being over our back against the wall. You know, we like being underestimated and we have this like, we'll show you kind of a thing. But it's changed now. We've been the, the number one team for a long time. We're the number two team after Ireland lately. And I'll talk to you about that a bit later. But we have to get you, we had to get used to the idea of running on the field as the favorites. We are expected to win. You said earlier, losing is not an option anymore. In the, in the past, it was winning was fantastic as long as we don't lose too badly if we do lose. You know, don't lose the 57 mil kind of a thing. How do you think South Africa adapted to that thing about not being underdogs, but being favorites anymore? What, what changed there? Well, it's fantastic. And I go back again to that magic bond within the squad that Rassi, Sia Khaleesi, and there's probably other people who are part of it that, you know, I, I, I don't know. And incidentally, I seem to be the only person in the world who hated that documentary, Chasing the Sun. Everybody else said, oh, my goodness. Well, I hated it. To me, it was blasphemy. You know, how can you show what happens in a dressing room, in a team dynamic, when a coach, you know, I'm, I fully understand it was, a, it was brilliantly done and so on. But as an ex-player, as part of a, a very, very exclusive group, that to me was absolute, absolute blasphemy. And in a way, it's sort of, and I could also see players acting and, 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 and you know, playing to the cameras and, and so on. But, but that's a side, a, a side issue. What, what I'm trying to say is there's something in a team that bonds it together. And you've got to get that balance between confidence, and I mentioned this before, and overconfidence. And it's, it's something that you cannot help. It creeps into you. And I'll give you a classic example. I was lucky enough 
to play in one of the greatest Curry Cup finals of all time. 1987, Ellis Park, pouring with rain, Transvaal against the Blue Bulls. And at halftime, Transvaal team were 15-6 up. We'd scored two great tries. We were there. And in those days, we didn't go into the comfort of the dressing room. We were standing there in the pouring rain and the hail. And I remember Yanni Breath, one of the greatest players that has ever played rugby. And I say that without fear of contradiction, an absolute rugby genius. And he was there saying, guys, 15-6 is not enough. And I remember, I was vice captain of the Transvaal team, looking at the players. And some of them were looking at the stands and the full stadium. And in my heart at that moment, I knew we were going to lose. And you'll know that Nas Porter mm. kicked four penalties and four drop goals with an old leather ball in the pouring, pouring rain. One of the greatest kicking uh, exhibitions ever in the history of rugby. One of the greatest performances. And we lost 24-18. At the first half, we were up for it. We had that balance between confidence and overconfidence. Absolutely right. And somehow we lost it. Now, that's the, the, the what's the word I'm looking for? The alchemy that a great coach has. He, I said to you earlier on, he gets the players to play for them. He's never one of the lads, one of the boys. There's got to be that gap between the coach there. Mm -hmm. You're playing for him, but you're also slightly scared of him. And, and funnily enough, I've seen it in, 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 in fact, one of the most recent things, one of the crazy things I've done in my life was I signed up for the pantomime in Johannesburg. I was asked would I play a, a, par, a, a part role in the pantomime the full professional, famous Johannesburg pantomime. And I did it a couple of years ago. One of the most amazing things I've ever done. 72 shows in two months, mm. three shows on a, on, a, on, a, on a Saturday. And we had a, a director, Tim Duplessis. And I said to him afterwards, you could have been a great rugby coach. He was a quiet guy. He had a sense of humor, but he was odd. But everybody on that stage was doing it for him. They wanted that nod to say well done mm -hmm. and I've seen it on radio I've seen it in business I've seen it on, on, on a rugby pitch it's that magic and you can't you can't define it it's something that is that is that is almost nebulous but it's that gift that says I'm putting my trust in this guy and I'm going to do it and you mentioned the spring box I think that I mean in history even in the bad times when the spring box I remember that game when we were hammered at Twickenham and um, do you remember uh, um, that the, the Springboks started fighting mm. and that big lock was sent off yeah, and, we were and so on? That's, that's the one, Laviscarpi. Forgive me, forgive me for forgetting the name. And I remember then we were so outclassed by a side that was so much better. And yet there was that fear of losing that the Springboks started fighting. And I think the same happened in, in 1974 against Willie, Willie John McBride's team. Now we've got to a stage where we're not, we don't have to fight. We don't have to, to throw our toys out of the cot because you can't fight anymore. But we can then galvanize and come back and do it. And the classic example was the World Cup where those last three games, we won three absolute must-win games by a point. Now, only a team that has got that balance right can do it. And I hope it continues. I really do. Because when a team is at the top too long. They start to just feel a little bit too comfortable. And this is where I think Rassi's policy of, instead of saying, you know, there's a four-year cycle to the World Cup, there after winning the World Cup, we get rid of all the old guys and bring in the youngsters. What he's doing is gradually mixing them in, allowing them to play with experienced players. And you'll see some of those experienced players drop out, retire, get dropped, whatever, as he moves towards the next World Cup. And, and I, I think, again, the fact that I've mentioned that and no one seems to realize the massive, massive potential in this country. And I hope Gayton McKenzie, the new sports minister, as well as wanting to appear in team photographs with the Springboks and, and, and make headlines. I hope he's saying that if a kid wakes up anywhere in South Africa and says, I want to try rugby, he will get a chance to do it. Mm -hmm. He'll get a chance to at least play rugby, have a facility, have a ball and boots and whatever, a little bit of coaching and the rest will take, uh, uh, um, take care of itself. But, but we mustn't get overconfident. And I love the way we're not arrogant. And in fact, it was um, one of the uh, English commentators. Na again, name escapes me. It happens when you get to 60. And, and um, he said, what I love about South Africa is when they beat France, when they beat France, 
most teams, when they win a, a, a huge game like that, it was the biggest game in the world. They'd knocked out the French in the World Cup, would have been celebrating, high-fiving, hugging each other. The Springbok team was over commiserating with the French team, almost every single one of them. The French players were obviously devastated. Go back and look at the tape. The Springboks were, and I thought that's marvellous because there's no arrogance there. There's, there's um, you know, obviously generosity. There's class in defeat as well. And that wasn't always the case with South African teams. And as I say, at this stage, it's almost too good to be true, MB. <laughs> uh, another thing that's not, that's not always been the case is the fact that the coach has been allowed to stick around. You think back, you know, I talked about it briefly. Nick Mallet got fired about moaning about uh, ticket prices. Jake White got fired <laughs> after winning the World Cup. Rossi is now on two World Cups and he's still around, you know, whether it's director yeah. or rugby or head coach, whatever. How do you think he managed yeah. to pull that one off? Because that, that's a bit of deft, you know, footwork there, you know, dodging all I the have... politics and the likes. He's a <laughs> bit more of a, a political animal than we maybe suspect. I have absolutely no idea. I mean, we know that, that sport and politics certainly in this country and certain other countries are never far removed. I always remember when people used to talk about the, what were euphemistically called the troubles in Northern Ireland, when there was this violence and bombing and IRA and British soldiers and, and so on. And there used to be a joke where the guy would say, and I'll, I'll do my best Belfast accent. He used to say, anyone who claims to understand the politics of Northern Ireland has obviously not been properly informed. All right. In other words, what actually happens is a mystery. And I think the goings on in rugby. But in those days, of course, you had Louis Late, who was an absolute total dictator. And my great mate, Edward Griffiths, of course, got fired by email, having done a wonderful job as CEO. will tell you a few stories about Louis Late, who I knew very well and sometimes loved him. And he had that gift of making you want to you want to perform for him. But he also had deep paranoia and suspicion about people and could be very, very vindictive uh, again. So um, Rassi, although he's been hired by Louis Late at times, is lucky that Louis Late is not running mm. rugby. And, and let's, let's hope that the, the sanity that seems to be prevailing at the moment uh, continues. Talking about, uh, people talking about in Rassi we trust. And Rassi is his mastermind. Rassi is this and Rassi is that. You mentioned chasing the sun. I know from first-hand experience that the, the Saturday before the Sunday that every episode went out, Rassi still had the final veto right on every one of those episodes. <laughs> He's such a micromanager, but also such a clever chess player, if you want to call it that. Yeah. Do you think that's part of his success? I, as I say, I've never met him, so I, sim I simply don't know. I still think the lights on the stadium was a big con trick. You know, I still, I still can't get my get my head around that one. But I, I simply don't know. And 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 you know, when 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 Rassi finishes, and I, or at some stage, I'd love to sit down with him and try and understand that that mm -hmm. particular guy. But again, that's part of the magic, isn't it? We don't want to know everything that goes yeah. on behind the scenes. What we want to see is when the whistle goes, the Springboks represent us in a way that is honourable and in a way that is honest and hopefully a way that's entertaining and successful. And uh, yeah, that's what I look for when the whistle blows. Well, talking about that, um, we've now won two World Cups back to back and we are aiming for the third one. But the difference between the 2019 Springboks and the 2023 Springboks, there was a quite a big difference in terms of the way that they played. And yet once again, now Rossi has now adapted you know, losing job, Ninaba, but don't worry, he takes it in his stride. And he's now changing the way the, the box are playing altogether. Call it Tony Ball, you know, for <laughs> for what uh, Tony Brown is bringing Tony to Brown. the box. What's yeah. your thinking about that? What do you think about that new approach? So when we were at that absolute nadir or nadir or whatever the word is, when we were at the bottom of, of the tree, losing by 57 points, um, etc., the whole world said, where's South African rugby? Where is subdue and penetrate, as, as mm. Dr. Craven used to call it? You take them on, you smash them up front, you soften them up, and then you run at them and, 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 and you cut loose. So the whole of rugby was bemoaning the fact that the Springboks were trying to play unsuccessfully all black rugby. Then, of course, Rassi came in and in an incredibly short time won the World Cup by playing a very, very limited game. I mean, if you look back, we, we were all sitting watching the... Uh, the games in Japan, the semi-final in particular against Wales. 
and we, we won it and it was great. But it was without a doubt one of the worst games of rugby you will ever see as an advert for a sport. If I was a Martian who'd come down and looked at rugby, I would have turned over to the professional wrestling immediately because mm. the rugby was so awful. But Rassi realized what he had to do to win the World Cup. And luckily, in the final, we got those two wonderful tries, which glossed over a lot of the problems. So rugby then, having bemoaned the fact the Springboks weren't playing this Springbok rugby, then the Springboks came and played rugby and the whole world said, this is terrible, this is killing rugby, etc. And now they're trying to move back to a, a more open game and, and force the game to be faster and more open. And of course, they're playing into the Springbok's hands. I can't believe it. They're actually forcing the Springbok, Springboks to bring in a new dimension to the game. And Rassi, I believe, has always intended on doing this. And, and uh, you know, Tony Brown, again, I've never met him. He was a wonderful, wonderful player. And there are just signs. In the same way as Jacques Nieber, Nienaber's rush defence took a while to get going. I mean, I remember that first game against England, where I think England at Ellis Park scored three tries in the first 15 minutes. And we were looking at this new defensive pattern and suddenly it was, it was awful. Mm. And yet when it developed, when it came through and reached its absolute height in the World Cup final last year, you know, with 27 tackles made by Peter Steff to Toy, what a player he is. And now we've got the same thing. And the hardest thing in rugby, the easiest thing in rugby is get your set pieces right. The next one is to get your defence right. Well, sorry, I suppose the easiest thing is to get your fitness right. Get your fitness first. Then you've got to get your set pieces. Then you've got to get your um, uh, 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 defensive play right. And the hardest thing is to get that expansive type of game because that requires incredible skill, incredible intelligence, and also that, that uh, ability to see uh, spaces and confidence, confidence to take chances. And I think that, that, that um, the signs are so good. The signs are so good. And, and the biggest problem, the hardest thing a backline can do is to run straight. If you drift, your opponents have got you on the inside and therefore you haven't got the speed to take them on the outside and they come back into the tackle. It is the hardest thing to do in rugby and always has been. Now I notice, even if they use this um, looping play, the man who's giving the ball is actually straightening dramatically and that is stopping the line and it's creating space outside. I never could understand how it worked, but we saw it perfectly done um, in Mbombela. Mm. You have to create a straightening of the line somewhere and that leaves space on the outside. And now, of course, when you've got a fullback like Fassi, I mean, do you know how big he is? You know, we look, we look at the players now and they're all so big. I mean, he's about, I don't know, nearly two metres tall. And he also caught Dianti a couple of years ago in that Curry Cup final when Dianti was the young player of the year and the fastest runner in, in world rugby. I remember the young Fassi caught him from behind. And of course, we've still got other players coming through now. Uh, this young fullback from uh, Kuhn Horn from, from the Lions is another terrific player to keep an eye out on. So this is, in a way, the final, I think, the final piece of the jigsaw. But we must never move away from the traditional strength, which are up front, mm. up front, pulverize, uh, sap the energy. It's, it's funny. I mean, while I'm on this theme here, if I can just continue, MBR, because mm. a lot of a lot of people of our age look at modern rugby and were confused by it. You know, I said earlier on that, that in the old days, that I think it was a famous, famous French coach said that rugby, you've got the piano movers, and these are the forwards who move the pianos around, and you've got the backs who play the piano. You get them the ball, and then they do the creative stuff. Now, of course, it's, it's all changed. And with professional rugby, with 15 fit people instead of, uh, you know, 10 fit people as it used to be, you know, your front five didn't do much tackling or, or, or running in the old traditional game on the same size pitch. Obviously, space is at, a, at an, absolute, uh, an absolute premium. But so often you see the almost mindless pick and go, pick and go, pick and go. You see the mindless kicking up in the air, kicking up in the air, kicking up in the air. And I remember chatting. In fact, it was in this very bar in, in, in my house. John Mitchell, the ex-All Black. And, um, you know, the man who, who coached mm. the All Blacks and was then assistant coach of, of, of England. And is now, I think, coaching the, won the Curry Cup with the Lions and then the Bulls. And now I think he's coaching the English ladies team. Mm. And I said to him once after several beers, I said to him, will you explain? And don't go into the cliches. Don't go into cliches about round the corner and all the things we laughed at before. Tell me about modern rugby. 
And he said, well, obviously you're dealing with 15 fit athletes. You're dealing with a much more organized game now. You use the phrase micromanaged. Everything is looked at and there's very, very little space. He said, when you look at the modern game, think of two letters. And the two letters are both P, P, two P's. One is panic and the other one is petrol. Panic and petrol. I nearly forgot it for a moment. He said, obviously, you want to create panic. You have a set move. You try and create panic. In fact, that's an area of the game I mm. think that still can be developed more. Attacking from set piece, uh, set piece play. But that's another one. So you, you try and create the panic. If a move works and, and somebody goes straight through like, like we did um, against the Argentinians, you created panic. That's wonderful. But a lot of the rest is actually using the petrol of the other team. You want them to hit that point of exhaustion quicker than your side does. So when the game breaks up in 60 minutes, it's, 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 it's in your advantage. You still have more petrol than they do. And I thought that's very sim simplistic. But when you look at a game of rugby now, you know, when you talk about uh, the teams winning the collisions, what are they doing? They're winning the collisions. They're going forward, getting the ball. The other team have to go back around. And you talk to anybody in rugby. And I know from experience, running back to defend takes a lot more effort than going forward, chasing a ball to attack. It's the same in soccer, attacking back, etc. in soccer. And when you look at the game of rugby with those two Ps in mind, so much of it actually makes sense. So much of the crash and bash, you're using up petrol. You're trying to get them to go backwards, etc. Then the game breaks up and you've got that extra advantage. And, of course, that then brings into the whole issue of re replacements, which I think mm. is ridiculous to have seven replacements on. I mean, it's so crazy. You've run your guts out. And next second, Jonah Lomu comes on for the last 10 minutes and you've got to mark him. I mean, how can, how can that be fair? But uh, I, I'll never forget what John Mitchell said about the two Ps. And I advise anybody, the next time you watch a game, just think, is that causing panic or is it using the opposition's petrol? And suddenly the game will start to make sense. Well, I I'm happy you, you said that to me because it does make a lot of sense to me. And it also plays into, you just mentioned the replacements. And I want to talk to you about the, the, the concept of the bomb squad. <laughs> For the fact that now you, you, you run out your position's petrol as much as you can. And just when they're running on empty, you bring on a completely new, fresh new team, basically. Or French new, a fresh new front row. Yeah. Or all of them at one time, like Rassi said, and that's what all the, everybody's going on about being so unfair and the likes. The point I'm trying to make is, and we also had the discussion on our channel recently, is the fact that no other team sees the, the role of the bench the same way as the Springboks do. We see that as two equal part of the same team, whereas the other teams, see, uh, other countries see that as a, the starting team as the, the best team, and then the, you get dropped to the bench, for example. Like, you're not good enough for the starting team, yeah, but you're going to yeah. play on the bench. And that's that's the difference between these two sides, the South African sides and, and the South African side and the other uh, other countries. What's preventing them from doing the, uh, uh, adopting a similar kind of a process? Um, maybe, it, it, maybe, it, yeah. maybe, it's, maybe it's a lack of similar quality players. Mm. And I go back, and I mean, I, I, I absolutely take your point. And, and uh, maybe it's the fact that we now have this pool of, you could almost say 70 players who could play for the Springboks and come on and make, a, make an example. And I think that you'll see other teams trying to copy that because when a team wins two World Cups, when it wins the championship, when it beats the British and Irish Lions, they are there to be copied and emulate. But maybe it's just a question of we have a, a particularly talented group of players, particularly up front particularly up front. I mean, when we change our scrum and we still bulldoze everybody, I mean, that's because the team that wins the scrums very rarely loses a game. They very rarely, because once again, you're winning all those penalties and you're using up using up all that petrol. But it's it's a tough one. And it was all Kitch Christie's fault. And I was a great friend of Kitch Christie and a, a very, very nice man, a very quiet man, but a very, very nice man. And if you remember, in those days, replacements only came on when there was an injury. But of course, Kitch Christie would bring someone off and the guy says, I can't move my back. Now, no doctor can say, you're not injured, go back on. And of course, players didn't want to come off in those days. And Kitch Christie then changed and said, and he started doing tactical substitutions. And, and once it started, you can't stop it. How you deal with it now, I, I simply don't know. And then you've got a situation where, of course, the three specialist front rowers, 
if you use up your subs on the bench, then you go to uh, um, you know effortless scrums, which is which spoils the whole art of scrummaging, etc. So I don't know what the answer to that question is, but uh, I do know it's 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 ridiculous. We love it at the moment because we have the bomb squad. But if it was happening to us and we were the ones who are suffering, we'd be the first to complain. All right. I want to talk to you about Ireland now, you know, being the number one team in the world. Congratulations, Scott. Do you think they are the number one team in the world or do you think it's the rankings? I couldn't, care less. I couldn't care less about the rankings. You know, I mean, yeah, what are the rankings there? I mean, they say it's about, you know, seeding for positions and so on. But if you're one, two, three, four, five, which the top teams are almost going to always be in, it doesn't really affect the it doesn't really affect the seedings to any to any great degree. Plus, if you go into a World Cup, does it matter if you you know if you meet the New Zealanders in the quarterfinal or the final? You know what I mean? It, it, it so, mm. so it means nothing. It's just it's just fodder for for journalists and and people to talk about. You ask Ireland which they'd rather have the World Cup or be number one in the rankings. It's a nice it's a nice little it's a nice little thing, but. Irish rugby has been one of the great success stories. I mean, I, I, I always tell the joke, I say that when I played for Ireland, if we won the toss, we did a lap of honour. You know, and I played nine games for Ireland and lost nine. And every, every so often, we, we always had some brilliant players. You know, I'm thinking of the, 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 the Mike Gibsons, the Brian O'Driscolls, uh, um, uh, Johnny Sexton, wonderful players come through, even though you might say rather cynically that a lot of them are coming from New Zealand and Australia these days mm. or South Africa, which is maybe a little bit, a little bit unfair. But what Ireland, what Ireland did was, A, they were lucky, and B, they were very, very clever. Because if you think about it, Ireland has got four provinces, uh, Ulster, Leinster, Munster and Connacht, They've got very, very good schools, uh, rugby competitions. I mentioned I was lucky enough to win one many years ago. They've got a vibrant club uh, system all over the country. But they've only got four provinces. So you get the clubs feed into the provinces, feed into one international system. So if you sat down to design the perfect rugby background, you couldn't come up with a better one than, than, than Ireland. Also, you have, I mean, rugby was always a sort of a minor game when I played compared to soccer and compared to Gaelic football and hurling, which are the, the national mm. uh, sports of Ireland and wonderful, wonderful sports. But they're both amateur. They're still amateur. I think people get expenses and they get great fame and, and glory from playing them. So a lot of the young guys, especially from the country areas, who in my day would never have played rugby, they'd have been playing Gaelic football or hurling. And they're big, strong country boys. You know, like New Zealand, like South Africa, the, the sort of the, 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 the physical specimens came out of the farms in those countries. And in a way, that's what's happening in Ireland now. And, and a lot of the great players you see now would have played Gaelic football, would have played hurling, and they're now coming into rugby. And there's a lot more of them. And now the ladies rugby team, I see, the women's mm. rugby team has just beaten New Zealand. Ireland women have just beaten New Zealand, which is the most amazing uh, uh, thing. The other thing that I think Ireland got right and I can stand corrected because I'm away from it now, is that you look at some of the countries where club versus country, you get these entrepreneurs coming in. They can't afford to own soccer teams, so they own rugby teams, and they interfere, and they try and keep their players from playing international games and so on. And it ends up with a, a rather messy organization. Certainly England got mm. themselves, some of the big clubs got themselves into that. In Ireland, the business people involved are also rugby lovers. It seems to be the vast majority of the, the people who are in to have to run the business and the coordination of rugby experts are also rugby lovers first and foremost. So what they've done is they've put the game of rugby first, I think. And, and uh, you know, when I look at, I mean, when I, I captained Leinster for two years and we won the Interprovincial Championship for two years and we played Munster in Thelman Park in the final game. And if there were... Five, seven thousand people there. It was a big crowd. Now I see them playing at at Croke Park with eighty four thousand people watching the game. You arrive in in Dublin, you see people now with rugby jerseys and rugby scarves around. So Irish rugby has been a fantastic success story. I'm delighted for them. Obviously, it's my my second team, and I've got so many friends who are still involved, and their kids are now playing for their. For the, for the Irish team, it's, it's terrific. I just hope they don't get arrogant. I've picked it up a little bit. I went over 
Um, I mentioned my 50-year reunion with my school team, Dublin High School, where we won the Leinster Cup, beating Belvedere College. And we had a great get-together. All but two of the team were, were there. And we coincided it with the European final, which was Leinster against La Rochelle. And there was a slightly nasty atmosphere. You know, amongst the crowd, there wasn't this sense of fair play. If the referee gave a, gave a decision against Leinster, he was booed, even though the decision was patently, obviously, a, a, a correct one. And, and after the game, Leinster lost, and there was a little bit of sourness. And I saw the same at, at, at Loftus with some of the Irish fans. So having absolutely celebrated, and I'm in awe of what Irish rugby have done, I just hope it doesn't go to their heads and they don't lose that special something that, that was always so attractive about Irish rugby and supporters. Just talk about uh, Andy Farrell quickly, and especially that second test in Durban. Um, I always I say lately, uh, rugby is more a game of chess where the coaches are the chess uh, <laughs> masters and the, the players are just simply the, the pieces on the board. But that game was special because um, I think it was probably the most physical test I've ever seen. I mean, we've they've broken us. They literally broke us. <laughs> the spring box, broken legs and you name it. And they ended up, you know, fittingly with a drop goal victory. They never gave up. That to me was one of the reasons why I think they they, they are, in terms of the numbers now, the number one team in the world. But I mean, let's, let's, let's make no mistake. They are a pretty damn good team, this one. They're, they're fantastic. They're absolutely brilliant. And I, having, having got that narrow win in Loftus, the game that I was with with our, our friend Sean Larkin, I fully expected the Springboks to win that second game well, to beat Ireland well, mm -hmm. because I know it's a professional game now and it's, it's all changed, but I don't care. You've been away for a few weeks from family, from friends. You've been living in a, out of a suitcase. You've been training hard. You've got to play this game and the next day you're going home. I, I, that's still a very, very tough one to, to, to take on board. And of course, the Springboks were a uh, cock -a hoop and, and obviously there was that bit of nastiness after the defeat in the World Cup when Ireland beat them and said, we'll see you in the final. And then they lost to New Zealand. And, and a lot of Irish people think they should have won the World Cup, which they didn't. So I was fully, fully expecting um, uh, the Springboks to belt Ireland or beat them convincingly. And Ireland came back with that wonderful drop goal by Frawley, who, if you remember, had missed a, a drop goal attempt in the, the European final. So even to mm. take that, that attempt was, was fantastic. And I'm delighted for Andy Farrell. I was lucky enough to meet him. Uh, Joe Schmidt, the, the former Irish mm. um, coach, uh, threw Ollie Campbell when Ireland played here. Uh, he, they very kindly invited Jenny and I for a drink with them to meet the, the, the management. And then we had a meal with the team and they presented me with an Irish jersey, which I thought was very funny. And I said at the time, whenever I played for Ireland, all you, all you ever wanted to do was drop me. Now you want to give me an Irish, <laughs> an Irish jersey. But I had a good chat to Andy Farrell because I'm fascinated by rugby league. I mean, it's such an incredibly hard game and, and so different um, from, uh, from, from rugby. And I sort of picked his brains and I found a very, very intelligent guy and I, I, in, to an extent a micromanager. And I think he probably learned a lot of that from, uh, from Joe Smith. And also he has got Ireland. I talked about this wonderful balance between confidence and overconfidence and this balance of your inner side, but there's always someone who can take your place. And, and he seems to have achieved that with Ireland. Sadly, they just don't seem to be able to do it when they get through a World Cup group. And as you know, they haven't won a knockout game in any of the World Cups so far, but it will come. Right, John, thank you very much. We've run out of time, but we're going to do this again. I really appreciate your time and it was an absolute <laughs> pleasure talking to you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. It's been great fun.